Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. So, kind of a good news, bad news situation. Bad news, uh, I fell and, uh, shit, <laughs> and fractured my L1 vertebrae. So essentially I broke my back, uh, and, uh, am on bed rest and everything, uh, for the foreseeable future here. Um, good news is, Getting a lot of reading done, so huzzah, there's that. Um, so I'm gonna try making this update because I've, uh, I've read some stuff. First off, let's talk about Barry Elminster Deep. As I'm sure is not surprising, I just skipped this. I tried to get into it, could not at all. No big shock there, right? Uh, next, let's talk about The Rose of Seraphal by Paula Claiborne. Um, I'm not familiar with Paula Claiborne. I'm assuming this is her first novel. So here's the thing. A couple of really good quotes in this that I liked. Let me, uh, let me just go through those first, I guess, and maybe those will lead into more. This is for what I assume is a first novel or early novel uh, by someone. This I thought was just a quote that really worked and is uh, deeper, and I don't even know if I understand it. Most of them had immediately collapsed into an unconsciousness that was expansive rather than profound. Well, that was great. Just, I'm like, you know, as a writer, I would never think of that. And so uh, that impressed me. And then here's another bit. This is Suka the gnome is in prison and she's thinking about the general supposition that two females of any race or species would have to have something in common as long as both wore tattoos. She basically thinks that, like, uh, people are, that these guys th that she's captured with must be okay because they all tattoo themselves. So here's the thing about Rose of Seraphal. You know what it reminded me of? It reminded me a lot of that, was it Cameron Hurley? Cameron with a K something who wrote that Priest's novel? And uh, it was like, suddenly kind of a third of the way through the book, we're thrust in this completely different plot that has to do with lycanthropes. This was a lot like that. Um, our main party consists of approximately 73 characters, but I thought that Paula did a, a really good job of kind of making them stand out enough so that I, I thought I was doing okay keeping them apart. Uh, and she also really uh, grabbed on to the kind of craziness of fourth edition, like there's a shifter in the party, you know, there's gnomes, like everybody in the party, it's it's not just mostly humans, and so I really like that. But at one point, they separate, and suddenly the plot has to do a lot with lycanthropes, although it wasn't clear if uh, one party's lycanthropes had to do with the other part of the party's lycanthropes. Then suddenly all of the characters met new characters in their plot line and I felt like I don't know our main characters well enough for this to work and and I got almost halfway through the book and I realized I can't follow this anymore I don't know who anybody is or what the hell is going on and so it was it was a frustrating experience for me because overall I enjoyed the beginning of the book I just felt like whoever made the choice to I mean, I assume it must have been Paula, but if there was some sort of editorial decision in there, whoever made the choice to separate everybody and introduce tons of new um, characters, and I, I, I just, I just felt lost. Like there were two characters who I thought I was really following really well. Uh, one of them was a Janazi, and I can't remember the other one, but like the Janazi is a water Janazi, and he loves talking about cooking all the time. And I thought, okay, I know these two and I can follow them. And then they're captured by probably lycanthropes. And um, and suddenly there are like nine new characters in their plot thread. And I was just like, oh shit, man, I cannot keep everybody apart. And so it was very, very frustrating. Because as I say, overall, I liked the writing style and I enjoyed the party. I just felt like... For a story like this to work, I needed um, a few more intro books or whatever with these characters to get to know them better. So that was kind of a mixed bag for me. Then the last book I want to talk about uh, is also another female writer, assuming that these aren't pen names, guys writing under female names, which is kind of the opposite of how it usually goes in the fantasy 
uh, realm. I want to talk about a, a book from the Wilds series. You know, not a. It's not. It's like the Harpers or whatever, right? It's not. A, it's not all connected. It's just a thematic thing. Uh, this is uh, the Fanged Crown by Jenna Helland, not Holland, Helland, um, and uh, this is. It, it takes place in Chult. When I started reading this, I was really worried that I was going to completely have the same problem that I had with Rose of Seraphall, though. Weirdly enough, more because there were a lot of crossovers with Rose of Seraphall. Both have, like, a young woman and then an older woman who are kind of the uh, backbone to the mystery in uh, of, of what's going on in the novel. Um, in Rose of Seraphall, it's two sisters, and in uh, The Wilds, it is a mother and daughter. But thankfully, or Fanged Crown, not The Wilds, but thankfully, uh, Jenna does a, a really good job of crafting these characters and making the ones who have known each other for a long time feel like they've known each other for a long time. And I really like that. Like, uh, I, uh, the couple of uh, passages that I wanted to quote here, I think both just illustrate that. So we have these two characters, Bolt who's like the dwarf first mate to Harp, uh, the captain of the ship that this starts on. And they are in Cholt uh, looking for, I think specifically looking for an artifact, but they are also looking for Liel, who's um, the woman who got, or the elf woman, the elf maiden who got away from Harp years ago. They find a body, and Bolt says, it's not her, unless she shrunk to dwarf size and gained a substantial amount of weight. That snapped Hart back to the present. It's a dwarf? Didn't I just say that? No, you said she shrunk to dwarf size. The corpse is a dwarf. It's not Liel. How do you know? Bolt stared at Harp in frustration. Because it's dwarf-sized, he sputtered. She's got dwarf-sized bones and a dwarf-sized head, and it's a dwarf's corpse. This is the stupidest conversation we've had with each other in a decade of stupid conversations. So it's like... Their, their interaction, uh, their chemistry feels very real, and it feels, uh, I don't know, like, I just, I enjoyed reading stuff between them, like, uh, and, and the other thing that I quoted is just another example of that, uh, uh they, uh, uh, one of the characters says something about how, like, he learned this tracking dwarves with his dad, and Bolt's like, I want to know why I was tracking dwarves. And uh, Harp says, can't a man just stalk a dwarf for the joy of it? Why do you have to make it sound all nefarious? Our main party here are those two, Harp and Bolt, and then a couple of uh, younger people. Kiddo, who is uh, uh, an elf man uh, who Harp met with the elf maiden Liel, and then Baron, um, a young, troubled warlock. So... I'm really mixed about this book, and it's very difficult to talk about because it doesn't have an ending, and that's very, very frustrating. Like, it's literally like I'm reading the book, and I get through this chapter, and it was a little bit of a frustrating chapter because suddenly the main characters turn into idiots and forget what happened in the last chapter. But I'm like, okay, whatever, they got to hold the idiot ball to get to the next chapter, I guess, and I turn the page... And it's like, hey, read this Magic the Gathering book. And I'm like, what? Like, I, I, I don't know how much it's worth going into the plot, but the young girl who's kind of at the center of this mystery, Isabel, we know pretty quickly early on that she's like the mastermind behind everything. And then at the very end, we find out that there's a twist to that, which I didn't see coming. And I was like, all right, it kind of was obvious, but I think Jenna did a good job of uh, uh, disguising it. And it, it, it just kind of ends with this essentially evil child going to talk to the queen um, and having our main party as a um, an escort. But the thing that she was mainly after seems to be safe. So it's like, okay, that's cool. And uh, our main love arc, which has a few false starts and stops throughout the book and was mostly what I was in uh, in this for, never gets resolved. And it feels like, I think the ending was meant to feel 
I th like I think it was meant to be kind of ominous and have this sort of Alfred Hitchcock like you know do -do sort of ending to it, but instead it just feels like well, what wait what like like our our main characters carry the idiot ball there, and I honestly was thinking oh these are duplicates of the main characters because there's this whole part of the plot where there's this one artifact that can recreate people as husks, but I thought like that's a little callous of the main characters to make husks of themselves to throw in as cannon fodder because the husks have your memories and everything so i'm like wow that seems pretty cruel but i i guess it's just supposed to be them they come and they're going to stop this guy who has this who's wearing this artifact so that it cancels all magic all around him but he's able to do magic and they come and they're like Oh no, he's already wearing it, it's too late, when literally the last chapter they saw him put it on and leave through a portal. Uh, like, that was the entire point of the entire MacGuffin chase through the whole damn thing, and they somehow forgot it. But, yeah, it just, I, I feel really frustrated by this, and as far as I know, this isn't going to be continued anywhere. I think it's weird because, uh, you know, a lot of people have said that they felt this way about Faces of Deception, which I thought just had a beautiful ending. I, I Like, I felt like you knew exactly where everything was going and why it had to happen that way thematically. This just felt like, oh, I hit 90,000 words, done. <laughs> like, I don't really know where to go with these plot threads anyway. Uh, extremely frustrating considering... I think there was about 10,000 words that could have been cut out of this, and then you could add an ending. Jenna had this habit of talking about an event and then switching to a new chapter or a new section to show the event happening live, and I'm like, there was only one of them where it was kind of useful, but then it was also kind of, uh, it was kind of a spoiler for the motivations behind one character. Uh, and it, I mean, it's a section with Liel. Uh, and Liel, through the whole thing, you're kind of like, the way that she and Harp left their relationship was kind of abrupt, and, and he still holds a torch for her, and it's kind of like, does she hold a torch for him, or does she hate him? It's possible it could have fallen out um, in a lot of different ways. And through that section, we see her caring for him and doing this stuff, and it's like, Okay, so I see that you this section, unlike every other section where we did a flashback, you couldn't just put it into the dialogue and make it half as long, but you also really shouldn't have shown this, because we want Liel's motivations to be a mystery until she actually shows up. But overall, I, I really enjoyed the character interactions, and um, and I like I found myself... I don't think I actually laughed out loud, but I kind of smirked along with some of the uh, uh, back and forth between the characters. And, uh, you know, there's a point where one character dies, and I really, like, felt it. I mean, I was like, oh, man, you know, that's uh, that's frustrating. I, I, I just, I wish it had a damn ending. I think years from now, I'm going to think about this book and think, oh, I should read that, forgetting that I have because it didn't have a damn ending. In fact, I liked the book so much that I looked up Jenna and found other stuff that she had read and, and grabbed that onto my Kindle so that I could have it for later. And now I'm not sure if I really want to go through with that or not. Uh. Anyway, uh, up next I think we've got some more Wilds and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some other stuff. But for now, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.